There you go. We're live. Yeah, we're live. <coughs> Can you hear me? And that's how we got it in YouTube already. Okay, so we're good. Oh, Angel, roll call it, and then we can vote on the resolution. Um, Mariel Ali. I'm sorry, Lazar, can you please identify? Let's leave her for last. We're voting on the executive resolution right now. And, and if I can, just a point yeah, of gonna... clarification, just because Emily and I co-chair the committee, what does that look like? Do we both vote? Is it one person votes? One of the two. Okay, thanks. Um, I will come back to Mario. Um, Mary Anderson? Yes. Uh, hang on a second. Uh, yeah, Faye, thank you for... Uh, the clarification when I put the motion on the floor, uh, uh, Steve uh, asked for an amendment. We approved right. the amendment was spent, so we need to now come back, put the motion on the floor again, and second it. So, can I get a motion on the floor for the approval of the resolution of the increase of our district manager? I motion. Oh. Yeah, I second. Debbie seconds it. Now we're ready. Thank okay. you. For um, Daryl Cochran. Yes. Catherine Diaz. Yes. Domingo Estevez. Uh, could, could I get, uh, could I be after Mariela? Sure, sure. Uh, Sally Fisher. Sally. I'm trying to unmute her. <coughs> if you can just say one for yes and two for no, that would be okay. Or she, does she have to say it? Literally. I think she has to say it. She has to say it, and also you have to bring it closer because we can't hear you. Yeah. There. Uh, no, I don't know. That's weird. We still can't hear you. Maybe she's muted. No, no. She's not she muted. She's on. Uh, she need to increase the volume then. Yeah, we lost her. I, uh, we will come back. back. Yeah, yeah. Can come back. Um, Fifth Lorimon. Yes. Isidro Medina. Yes. Um, Emily, uh, well, Emily's next, but yeah, get, give us a, a second. I'm just waiting till Mariel. Sure. I guess to look. Sure. Um, Debbie Nababian. Yes. Steve Simon. Abstain. I vote yes. I need uh, to vote again. You need to vote again? Because I my vote was cast before. Oh, uh, before yes, you're correct, Mary Anderson. Yes. Thank you. Okay, so do we do we have Sally? No. Emily and Mariel, have you come to a consensus? Yeah, we vote yes. I vote yes. Domingo, you vote yes as well. Um, do we have Sally back on? We have Joel Keys from the except from business development. And that'll Joel, how do you vote on the resolution? Yes. Say it. No. Sally, you vote no. Yes, I vote no. And um, Eliasar has last. Yes. Yes. Okay. That concludes.
with that portion of the agenda. Ariel, did she vote? She did. Okay. Checking everybody here. Everyone's voted. All right. Voted. The tag team said yes. All right. And, All right. and we had enough. And we had enough for quorum. Yes, we do. Yes. Okay. Uh, gonna uh, congratulate you on your effort. I know this was uh, a long. Uh, it was a it was a lengthy uh, uh, process, uh, but it was a good one because it, now it begins to establish uh, some parameters as to you know how staff and the district manager should be evaluated. And uh, this is the beginning. This is uh, something that has been said plenty of times that it needs a collaboration of, of course, the Manhattan Borough presidents and established policies that can secure uh, the transparency and the effectiveness of, of our board. Uh, I think that we just moved a great leap of faith from uh, subjectivity to objectivity. And that's something that uh, I'm very proud of. Uh, Catherine Angel, Joel, and Debbie, uh, the mathematician of the group, and everyone else. Uh, is, uh, I think this, uh, it's a lot of stuff that we can take away from this process. Uh, I'm going to now uh, try and move it on to um, uh, Fen. I know that you got to go because you, you no, I'm gonna do. Thank you. I'm gonna do my report, and then after my report, I will. Uh, I'm gonna leave. But I have a question. Does this a solution? I can't. Can you unmute yourself? Yeah. Go ahead. It's muted again. Fay, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, yes, my question is that if this resolution will go to the general meeting, and also I added that after my report, I'm going to leave the meeting. Okay, the answer is yes. That's where it's oh. definitely should be, uh, of course, like any other resolution generated from any committee or the, and the executive committee has to be ratified by the general uh, board in order to be uh, unapproved or denied or an effective right. solution. So yeah, that's the next step. All okay, right, so you. I'm gonna try and get uh, Ebenezer to give us his report. Uh, have the next five minutes These are all yours, Ebenezer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to say to thanks uh, the executive committee for uh, reviewing my petition and for voting tonight. With that said, I very quickly report. Uh, you remember last month, I reported an issue at the uh, corner 165th and Amsterdam Avenue uh, at the corner uh, uh, close to the Gregorio Luperon uh, High School that was in disrepair and the construction was stalled since this summer. Uh, after I uh, started inquiring about it, uh, I was re it was reported at uh, the district service cabinet meeting that the construction uh, uh, there was from Connedison. Connedison investigated the matter. They said that no, that this construction uh, belongs to DEP. So we contact DEP, DEP made the repairs. And right now, uh, I got an email this afternoon before we start the meeting from DOT saying that the uh, curb was repaired, the, the DEP uh, cash basin was repaired. And also after I started in inquiring, they uh, made the corner safe and the students and pedestrians were able to close by, uh, to cross the street uh, properly there. Uh, this is what I have now. We have been very busy with uh, in the office processing the um, uh, the budget consultation is already done. Uh, we are reviewing the, the last uh, the estimate of this need to, uh, to submit it uh, uh, by tomorrow, the latest uh, to uh, 
uh, the uh, the city. So thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. This is the end of my report. <laughs>
this is not an example of corruption or hush money or lobbying. This is about transportation policy. And, and, that, and that's fine. If people want to put forth a resolution about impact on businesses um, and can separate the impacts of a pandemic where people substituted to online shopping, where they can, and they can separate issues of a recession and separate issues of an of a absolute crisis of inflation and all of that, from a busway that gets tens and tens and tens of thousands of people moving a little faster. Like, that's cool. Like, I'm not, I don't have a dog in that hunt, but I will say that, like, as a board, we voted in favor. And I know some of the people on this call were not in favor, but we acted as a board. And so, and that, so again, if we're doing something else, we can do something else. But, you know, we're sort of substituting sort of a, then let, like, let's do it through the process. Like let's, if we want to bring it up through business development. If you want to introduce something and take it up through TNT and it gets support, that's great. Like I'm all for anything that we feel like we want to pass, but I, I don't think it's fair to call the work of the board, a committee, and then a full board. And just because some people didn't go along with it and then sort of say it was all about who got paid. There's plenty of information that I can provide about where this resided in the context of urban transport policy, which has a goal to reduce a crisis of congestion citywide on our streets. Wayne? So I get, you know, I get that there's other issues and we should absolutely deal with that. But like, let's also show, you know, we can't kind of contravene the action of the board by a resolution. Wayne, Wayne, you gotta omit yourself, Wayne. I just said I want to point out from at least from the planning perspective, one of the things that is troubling is when information opinions are shared, um, but it's not clear what happens to them on this matter, and I'm not talking about or even implying that anyone, you know, got paid and lobbying is part of the political process. So we all know that. But I recall we had a distinct conversation with representatives from DOT about the busway. And we said it was important to balance the traffic considerations with the economic development impacts on the businesses and that it shouldn't be a siloed effort. And I think that's what we're saying now. Um, and you know, Debbie is absolutely right that busways are transportation issue. Moving them in a more efficient way is important. But I think what we shared months ago that you should need to balance the transportation concerns with what is the impact on local businesses is what we're seeing now to be the issue that it's it wasn't balanced. Yeah. Um, we're in the middle of oh, just making comments and questions to Ebenezer's report. So on that regard, I'm going to just take one last question yeah. from Domingo and move along before I last make my comment uh, regarding uh, something that affected not just what I think, but my pocket. So you go ahead, uh, Domingo. Yeah, my apologies, because I felt that um, that came out in the heat of the moment. I didn't mean to insinuate that anybody got paid or anything like that, but obviously when uh, sometimes uh, feelings get tangled up and understanding the current uh, climate in which we're in. So I want to apologize. I don't want to make it seem like uh, lobbying, and you're correct, Wayne, lobbying is part of the political climate, uh, but uh, my apologies to the board for, to the executive committee members for actually saying that. I didn't mean, I didn't mean to say it. It was just something that came out in a very passionate way uh because of the the impact that i feel every single day um just being able to uh work a block away from that corridor and the and the traffic and the and the congestion that it creates so uh i hear you debbie and and i think this is a good place to i was one of the people who voted for it you know um but it was supposed to be uh a, a way of 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 it was in a in a trial period where there were going to be certain town halls where there were going to be certain conversations 
And as Wayne uh, so eloquently stated, it had to meet uh, some needs. And, and, and we could throw everything on the pandemic, but there are direct impacts from that lane um, to, to not only business uh, folks, but to people who live in that area and people who have children attend schools in that area. Like the congestion that is... So my question is, we're supposed to alleviate uh, the busways, right? It's still congestion. That's one, right? And number two, uh, there has to be a way, and we come back to the DOT again, of uh, being able to involve the community in ways, especially when measures impact the community's way of living. So I think it's very important, Debbie, that we engage in that conversation. I'm not trying to say let's strip a committee, but I think it is important to engage in this conversation. I'll be there with you, Isidro, as well. But I think we have to be able to speak on the impact that something like this has, if done permanently. That's all I'm trying to say. All right. Uh, and I'm going to take my hat off uh, from uh, as a chair of, of the community board, and I'm going to wear it as a, as a uh, local merchant uh, of the same area. And if you, if the, in, the intent and the purpose was to alleviate the traffic and make sure that the buses uh, travel a little faster, I don't think that they've accomplished the mission entirely. And if you want to turn a residential area into the cross Bronx, like what has happened with 182nd Street and 183rd Street, we'll see four or five years from now, the asthma increases from the, the, the incredibly uh, uh, increase in, in traffic because you know you have the same amount of cars crossing the bridge coming from the Bronx into Manhattan, but they just travel indifferently. That, that hasn't stopped for one. And the second thing is that there's a coincidentally uh, parallel and in and, and, and the proliferation of franchises and the bustlings. Uh, and the closure of the small businesses. We've had, what, six or seven just between Audubon and, and, and St. Nick that just had to close because they couldn't get the same amount of traffic. Is that coincidental? I don't know. I leave it up to your imagination. But, you know, before the bus lanes, there weren't no chipotles or, 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 or chicken fillets or KFCs. There was none of that. But apparently, they just come out of the blue. And I'll leave it to your imagination. Isn't Chipotle and Target picked 181st Street because the busway? Come well, on. <laughs> well, yes. uh, yeah. if you're well, going to allow David to speak, then we all should be allowed to speak. Well, okay. I like, think. Has no, no, to no, no. I have, let me just be. Let me just be. Uh, Debbie, you can put it any way you want. I have a stake in the game. I've lost a substantial. No, 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 no. no. You could. Uh, no. It, mine, mine is a lifetime experience. I. It was, it was a, the suffering of myself and a few others. I, I didn't lose anything but a bunch of money. So I know the impact that it had. I know the traffic. I know who comes from where. So I leave it at that because I don't want to turn into a discussion that man necessarily go anywhere. And, I'm, and like, I'm, I'm upset. This, is, this should not be a laughing yeah. matter because when one small business go out of business, it's no, a big problem for the community. This should right. not be a laughing matter. And I think really, I'm not really... laughing. All but right. So we're this turning is not... this into a meeting about something that came through the committee. Like, then put it yeah. on a business development. Like, let's deal with it as a board. But yeah. you're like making all these comments, and it's not like, why are we doing okay, it? Let here? me let me try and, and, and just manage it. I think that we have divergent opinions about the same issue. We all have different experiences, it affects us differently. And therefore, our passions will be different, all right? Some people will defend their opinions, but other people like me will defend their own personal interest. So that's how it goes. So moving along, you have another shot at it. You have a, a report to give Debbie in a few minutes. So we're going to try and get the approval of the calendars of November and actually uh, November and... January of 2023. Have you guys taken a look at it? Do you, is there anything, any changes that your committees would like to uh, 
making the changes on. Steve. Yeah, on the uh, January calendar, uh, uh, my committee meeting is uh, listed at, at seven o'clock. Is, is that because we're assuming that uh, we'll be meeting in person again at that point instead of uh, via Zoom? Well, well, what, what, why was I moved to seven o'clock? It's really up to you. I mean, I just can put it back to six thirty. You just, you just, yeah. While while we're on, while we're on, uh, uh, while we're Steve, on, Zoom, while Steve, we're on Zoom, what? I'm, I'm, well, I'm sorry to interrupt. Darryl. No, I think that the Darryl. committee vote, the committee voted for that. No, the, the committee oh, voted right. to be at six thirty. So, what what is your question, Steve? My, my question is, uh, um, uh, until we hear otherwise. My committee should continue to be listed at 6.30 and not at 7, as long as we're meeting via Zoom. All right. Now, Daryl, you got something to say to that? As long as you don't unmute me again, yeah. I mean, well, well, I, will say, your, I will if you don't raise your hand like everyone else. I'm just trying to reply to this. You know, it's so weird that we can't have conversation. Of course you can. And clearly, oh, I was trying to earlier. But no, I was said, Steve, it was voted on in committee a long time ago. I, I do remember it being on your committee when that happened. Mary. You, you misunderstand my point. I'm saying that, uh, that my committee is asked to remain at 630 and not be moved back to 7 uh, while we're uh, meeting via Zoom. Okay, maybe that's the current committee. That could be. Well, you, you're, you're the one who asked that we move to 630. When, when you remember my I haven't my been on the committee in a while. Yes, but why? Anyway. <laughs> okay, so point clear. So you want to go back to six thirty or stay at seven, Steve? Six thirty while we're still meeting remotely. Good, Ebenezer. Switch it back to six thirty. Not, not a problem. I would do that. Anyone else? My hand is up. Oh, Mary, I, I'm I'm sorry that I stopped you from. Taking your order, order. December, in December, the agent committee says 10 a.m. It should say 10:30. Ebenezer, 10:30, please. Yes, I will say 10. Okay, beautiful. Uh, Steve, better lower your hand. Mary, you have to lower your, your hand as well. Okay. All right. All right. So um, moving along, we have the January and December, December 22s and January 23 calendars already approved. Uh, Wayne, anything? You're good? Those dates? Debbie, you're good? Um, the, the dates look fine. All right. Beautiful. So uh, I guess the uh, first one up is <coughs> Faith. Are you still with us? Are you? You left us, Faye. All right, I see you on the committee chair's report. Thank you. Um, yes, well, officially, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so I just have uh, wanted to report that we actually have two presentation and a few uh, comments that was raised during or reported during the uh, new business. So unfortunately, the first, we had the 34 and the 33rd prison, but it was no show, unfortunately. Uh, but the second item was the, uh, we have a students uh, uh, to address the issue of safety around the school uh, vicinity. And uh, the student and some of the parents that attended the meeting expressed uh, much concern. So I encourage you to see the, uh, the meeting. Uh, following uh, that presentation or that discussion, because with the student and the parent was just a conversation, basically, um, we uh, I reported that it's something that just happened in the school system. There is a new policy that DOE had uh, adopted. The policy is about um, <clears throat> the radio channel communication that a school used to communicate with the school safety when there is an issue on, you know, on any of the uh, classroom or the school. So what happened now is that school safety 
uh, staff from the school uh, not necessarily can call directly the uh, school safety, let's say on the first floor, whatever they are located within that school. So instead they are giving a number where they call sort of like a 311. So they call and then they send, uh, you know, uh, a school safety. <clears throat> the problem that I find on this is that uh, the time frame between a, let's say an incident is reported and by the time that they answer, anything can happen. And uh, if one of the staff, for example, get in between the, in the fight between let's say two or three students whatever and that staff get hurt the staff the uh the hospital uh cost is not going to be paid by the union and and and, and i think that this is a process also that was adopted uh expeditiously and also parents were not informed and uh, a lot of uh, you know staff are kind of concerned about this because uh, it was really uh, for them was working the uh, when they have access to immediate access to uh, school safety uh, just call them directly and they immediately come to the floor where the incident you know is happened. So uh, next month I announced that uh, I'm going to try to invite school safety. Uh, and and to gather, you know, the version why exactly parents were not informed and why exactly they took that decision. Because I really think that a school should have an immediate access to a school safety officer in the event that any incident, you know, especially violence. So, and this is where, you know, we left the conversation. So hopefully next month I might be able to invite school safety to explain exactly this new policy that they expeditiously implemented without any input from the parents or not even, you know, ask the other uh, personnel. They just told here is the new, uh, the new policy that we're implementing, no more radio channel. You just have to call this number and report and we will answer. So this is my report. Hey, uh, I have a question. Maybe I should have raised my hand. Uh, yeah. I'm sure you all of you have heard the news on the uh, University of Virginia uh, killings and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, how the whole situation went down and how the uh, perpetrator felt that he was being uh, harassed or bullied. Uh, what are our, our schools doing about uh, bullying and, and, and that sort of situation is there anything that you know comes to your your mind or has come across your committee in reference to you know the same kind of uh, situation there well one thing that i really wanted to if we were to have quorum is to um suggest a, res a possible resolution but we need to gather the facts and more uh, you know, uh, I would say more information and I think that would be possible when with me, the uh, school safety, because we really need to give them the benefits of the doubt and find out exactly, uh, you know, more details in order to, you know, go aggressively and deny that this is not did it, did it, that. So, but we want to hear from both sides. So hopefully we may have folks from the school safety and the school uh, you know, and the school system. So, if that was your question, I don't know if I. Yeah. 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 So, I just. Yeah. There is a possible figure. resolution that. Yeah. You know, that we may consider, but let's see how this will play out. But I think it's a very uh, important issue that uh, a, a staff, uh, you know, have to deal with. And this is something how to find like more amicable. Uh, solution to that, calling to 311 or calling to whatever number and wait for them to come. I don't think this is really a good thing. So thank you. Got it. Thank you. Uh, you know, Deb, maybe. Steve, you have a question for Faye or? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure that the uh, Department of Education has instituted an anti-bullying uh, program. Uh, I think we should find out uh, uh, from the school district six, the extent to which it's being implemented in our schools. Uh, I, I, I definitely can recall reading about it uh, at least a, a couple of, of years ago. So uh, there's something more than just relying upon the uh, school safety offices. There should, there's supposed to be an active uh, uh, curriculum uh, and, uh, or some kind of program that's, uh, that's to be given to uh, the kids. 
Well, I want to say that, and yes, you might be right, and in a perfect world, that would be the right thing that you would think that would happen. But we may have leaders, and I am not necessarily pointing fingers here, but you may have leaders that they fall into their comfort zone, and they may not necessarily fight, you know, for, for the right cause. So they just go and take whatever they 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 heard because they don't like to challenge the system. And uh, I think that leaders that really want to make sense of in particular policy of this issue where parents have been ignored, a staff, it, it's not any advantage for the staff who are the one dealing with a problem. I think that uh, leaders like the superintendents of the district may uh, may take the upper hand and question that. If he have done that, I am not sure. But it seems to me that nobody is, you know, talking about that. And by the way, that was probably almost like a month ago where they come up with that. It's like everybody accepted. They but, kind of afraid to challenge the system, and let's go with a new implementation of this policy. And I, I, th I think we're talking about two different issues. Yeah. But, uh, I, I, I think it would be valuable, Faye. I would recommend uh, that you ask the school district to come to your committee and mm -hmm. give a presentation to, on, on what they're doing to deal with the uh, uh, anti bullying. Uh, yeah. uh, and I, I think uh, Ellie raises a very, very important issue. And uh, this is not the first instance uh, where somebody has. Uh, uh, acted out because of bullying happens, I think, uh, uh, fairly often in these uh, in these violent incidents, these shooting mass shootings. So uh, I I I, uh, I urge you to uh, uh, to uh, ask the school district to uh, come before you and talk about what they're doing on this particular question about bullying. No, I definitely have that in mind because I'm not going to go over our you know district head. But uh, I'm going to write an invitation or I'm going to start a conversation in which definitely I will start, you know, with him and copy the school safety. So we all going to start this conversation on the same page. So and we will take it from there. But next month, definitely, we I would like to find out more about this new policy. But thank you for, you know, but definitely, yes, this is our just merely, you know, protocol. You go first to the district superintendent and uh, you copy the, uh, you know, like the, uh, in the, this case, the school safety, and then we will take it to, you know, from there and let's see where all this is going to lead us. But the part that parents were not, uh, and this is not the first time we're not informed. And, and you know, it's, it's I, I have seen this so many times that policy has been implemented without parents' info, without the community. Uh, inputs and then you know nobody's saying anything. Perfect example. Remember when they implemented the child school in Mother Cabrini? Nobody knew anything about that except after a few months or two months after they already you know sealed the deal. And I found this so disrespectful because we are not informed of that. So in like that, there is a lot of issues that goes you know behind the curtain in our district. But thank you for the suggestion, Steve. Steve, yeah, we'll uh, proactively uh, research it a bit more and help and assist Faye to get whomever uh, uh, has to uh, uh, come in and talk about it. My my children come, go to the public school system here yeah. in the city. So. Uh, this is a very, if, it's a very if, significant issue, and I'm glad you brought it up. Yes, well, if, if anybody doesn't have any question, I respectfully... Uh, has yeah. to be, you know, this me. I really don't feel that well, but I want to just to comply with my responsibility. So I want to thank you all, and uh, I will see you on the general meeting. I will end. All right. Get well, Faye. Get Take fun. care. Bye. Thank you all. Good night. Debbie. Um, so we had um, one Brezzo item uh, in the past month, uh, but let me just make a quick comment. We did. Um, meet. We have yet again a new MTA governmental liaison. He seems great. Hopefully we'll get to actually keep him. Um, yeah. I had the opportunity to meet him in person last week or the week before where I went on behalf of, well, both CB12 and from um, the congressman's office, we were in both CB12 and um, various um, stakeholders in the neighborhood were invited to be part of something which was so super cool, which was 
that there will be um, one of those magnificent pieces of art that are in many of our stations, but not a ton of our stations uptown. Um, but that will be part of the ADA project currently underway um, on the north end of the 181st Street A station. There's a whole process uh, and a panel who votes on such things, but they allowed some this panel to sort of um, beyond the, the strictly voting people um, to review the portfolios of um, a, wh a whole bunch of artists. I don't know if there may be 40 artists um, and then sort of narrow it down a little bit. Um, we obviously, those of us there from the community were we're eager to see local talent and because we have such a deep bench of art talent in the um, in the area and certainly a good percentage uh, were not, but not all. Um, and so that was a really interesting process to be part of. It will, um, and then there'll be sort of like a part two to that. Um, we had, um, DOT came, the bike group came with um, a proposal that relates to the Washington Bridge. So people remember there was an emergency con uh, project bridge repair that took, I don't know, two years. Um, and at the time, there were some people that were saying like, okay, you're doing all this work and why didn't you put in a bike lane? But it was emergency work on a bridge, which you cannot you know, mess with that. Um, but DOT actually came with a proposal now because there have been calls from several of the electeds and writ large to have more uh, bike and pedestrian connectivity between the Bronx and Manhattan. And, um, and the Washington Bridge in particular, because apparently the way you would do it, and I've certainly never ventured to do it, is like this really narrow path where everybody's together, strollers, scooters, bikes, pedestrians, blah, blah, blah. And so what they came to us with was um, an idea uh, somewhat supported by the fact that because it, that we had this time with the project where it was like two lanes at most either way rather than the usual three and that was sort of fine, um, they realized that they had a little room to sort of design. So what they did was they put a dedicated bus lane for eastbound going to the Bronx because that traffic, I guess, is worse for some reason, you know, on that side. And then, but on the, sorry, coming into Manhattan side, they will leave the pedestrians to the existing pathway that they've been currently using, but move the bikes into a protected lane. And so it was a good proposal the one catch was um, that they're, they're going to have to use a block of Laurel Terrace. So when the bikes come off at that McNally Plaza, 181st, right before Amsterdam, they're going to remove 20 spots from Laurel Hill Terrace. Um, that part that just goes kind of from McNally Plaza and then takes you up kind of roughly around 182nd to, to Amsterdam. Um, the um, they did incorporate something that Ebenezer has been advocating for consistently and strongly, which is that people coming into Manhattan really want to turn left. And the way they had designed it when it reopened was only one dedicated left turn lane. So then you were tying people up who were getting stuck behind a second lane that also many have wanted to turn left. So they've now incorporated that into the design, um, which was good. Uh, and, um, and so the committee passed that um, with sort of the will be run resolved saying like, and they said they will try, you know, to try to find us some parking spots elsewhere, um, somewhere in the area. Um, Cause that's like, obviously a lot. Um, there were a lot of people um, from transportation alternative there. So we had in the public group, it was like a lot of people 
took their two minutes and 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 said their piece. Um, and then the last thing I will say, just as point of clarification on the earlier discussion, is I think that there is really not a bigger crisis than that facing small businesses and certainly uptown. And why uptown? Because uptown, um, we, um, we're one of the last areas that is a place of small business and hasn't been overrun by big box stores and chain retailers. And I think this is a huge thing and I'd love to see us take this on. And I have the perspective, not just on 181st street, but throughout the district because of my day job. And I will say that um, landlords are taking everybody to court. They are not negotiating with people. People are a little bit behind and a lot of them didn't cut it. Some did, but very few cut a deal when barbershops, hair salons, restaurants were all shut down. The federal assistance to restaurants was a third of what it needed to be. And thanks to Republicans, it never got passed to fund the rest of that program. And most res, you know, restaurants have, cannot recover from that and have continued to close. So the idea that we try to t make really delve into this idea of we don't want to lose what makes us distinctive and being a true place of small businesses that were completely hammered by a pandemic, by a recession, by inflation, by costs that don't allow them to make a penny, by landlords who don't want to rent to them and they just want the shiny happy money of chain stores, absolutely. And if the and if the busway has also added to that picture, that too, that too. But it is it is. Um, but but the landlords have a lot to do with this. And it's them making the choice of like being picky and choosy about, oh, I don't want somebody who doesn't have a long track record or I'd like the guarantees of a big public corporation or whatever, whatever, whatever. So I in no way make light of this subject at all. I'm just saying, let's let's take on the whole picture because we are still seeing and we're gonna continue to see more closures. And I'm talking to people every day that are jammed up and being hauled into court where they're not necessarily going to have, you know, the representation that you have as a person on a personal basis with your apartment where you can get legal representation, et cetera. So I hope that clarifies exactly what I do think about this. And I'm sorry, I should actually say one more thing on a personal basis. I've got a little um, situation that I'm dealing with. And I'm not myself today, and I apologize for that. And I will duck out after taking questions on my piece. All right, if you don't mind, I'm sorry. Yeah, just hope you feel better. That you know, first and foremost, your health is, you know, number one. Uh, uh, guys, uh, Isidro and uh, Domingo. Thank you so much, uh, Chair and Debbie. Uh, I think it was a great meeting uh, that you held with uh, DOT um taking into account that you know i was there representing small business because uh, I, I truly believe that by taking all, over 20 parking spots from an area that has lost over 40 parking spots by the busway and now creating this uh new way that would uh practically destroy I think uh, it will be chaotic. Our residents are not going to stand for it. And um, as far as like uh, having the community being built by small businesses, this is going to end. Uh, nothing against uh, bike lanes. I support bike lanes. I think that they should get uh, some type of protection because I think it's chaotic, though it is now, where pedestrians and cyclists are now sharing the same uh, pathway. But it cannot be at the cost of small businesses growing in our community as they have for over 50 years. Um, I think that, you know, DOT, whatever they say, they're not going to find those parking spots that are going to lose. Um, I went yeah. around today uh, telling people about the new proposal and basically people just, they said like, you know, we, we're giving up. Uh, that's just the attitude. I hope that things will change. I think that'll be a happy compromise. Again, I, I think that bike, bikes are important, uh, but we should also think about 
the prosperity of small of our small businesses. Thank you, David. Um, I I know it will never happen, but our precinct and the FDNY take off over an enormous amount of parking spots, like 75, like, you know, they, if I were that dollar store, you know, that opened on Broadway, I'd be pissed. <laughs> like, I, I don't, you know, they're, you know, but we, but we don't like, you know, just if just they, they could give back 10, they've got like 70. So, and FDNY's got a lot right on 181st. So, and then they take some extra. And so like we got, there's a, you know, I, I don't know if somebody's got that kind of heft, but. <laughs> yeah. And even that food court and they're like, I don't know how they're doing it without any meter spots. And they, and then, then they've got all that stuff on there. They can't load anything. Anyway. So, um, you good for two more or you feel okay? Yeah, no, no. I, I just, I'm, I'll, I just, uh, no, absolutely. Absolutely. Domingo. Yeah. Sorry to hear that. Debbie. It's, it has been a, 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 a tough few weeks, uh, but, um, my my only thing is Debbie, and it's with the task at hand. I, I actually appreciate that you acknowledge the intersection of of everything, right? How everything is aligned with each other. But I think what we're discussing, and and I think uh, I'll refer back to Wayne as he that he spoke about it very eloqu eloquently. Is 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 just why are we not considered when we're talking about designs that impact our community? And I think that alone is what we're trying to address, right? Why are we compartmentalizing so many conversations as opposed to bringing a lot of things together and being able to address some of these concerns? And, right. and I'll lay to rest there. I understand we, we live in a society where certain things are priorities. I understand that. I understand the greed portion of it. But I also understand that this has to do with being able to be thought partners with a community that you're shifting uh, the everyday day of life. And I think that's what we have to address. Right. I mean, we have, there is more data we need about, you know, the, there, you know, they, they were, are on the hook and they have provided some preliminary about impact on bus speeds and impact on the side streets. Um, and I, and I, and I do think the eastbound speeds wasn't, that they need they need to be more improved or else why did we why did we do this um and there's some people who believe that unless you can get the all door boarding going east so you can get people on the bus like it's 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 not going to improve that much so there's absolutely things that they are on the hook for to still to like to see to deal with the impacts but the, it's not that the, we didn't have those conversations about impacts on the side streets um, and seeing the data on it and, uh, and all of that. So I think, and we need, and we need to continue to, to do that where we see that. And then I, I also just wonder, I know wheels may come back to us. You know, they've been trying to get like more permanent closure, I guess, on the, or the all the schools on the, to have like close another block nearby. And then, but those are the blocks that have been impacted by some increases in traffic. So um, so I think we do need to, oh, and, and like, I, and we I say can't, that to say just because it's Debbie. permanent doesn't mean we, like, if we, if we, we have issues on a couple of places and we need to continue to pursue those, um, and, and it, and it needs to, yeah. And so all that, so I, I, but, and, and they have come back to us, but I just feel like the first round of data that they brought back was all like, it wasn't. It, yeah. me, it wasn't readable. And then, then the way they took out the pandemic, like it just didn't make sense to me. So I think we do need to continue to ask for yeah. we're looking for at, at that stuff. But I'll um, tell you, I'll tell you what, David, and I, I want to chime in before I pass it on to Daryl. Uh, there is data and I have some of it, not all of it. But I can show you um, point by point, uh, address by address, local space by space by space that the impact in uh, at least in 181st street that the bus lane ha had and Cesar can a voucher to this 
were greater than the pandemic economic. No, but that's great. But I'm saying, but let's, well, let's, saying, let's, so, let's do it. Yeah, 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 it yeah. is important. Let's yeah, yeah. do it. Right, right, right. I'm not, you know, I'm not. But I'm saying don't do it in TNT. Like, let's, it's bigger. Yeah. Like, let's yes. do it where we're taking that and we're taking all of it. Yeah, yeah. That's I it. just, I just wanted to just bring that. Yeah, up. but, but there's not like, okay, never mind. Yeah, I, but I, just, I'm not you, have a, you have a, you have a, before, before, you have a process, right? You have presentations, outreach, implementation, but there's always never a correlation between the in unintended consequences of all of these great ideas and and a, a reversing back or adjusting or remodeling to the same look, to the same community that you implemented them to. And that's the issue that I think Domingo and Isidro have been trying to, you know, yeah. no. um, is, is no, those, no, those no, I, I don't, I, I don't, I don't disagree. All right, beautiful. Daryl. Um, yeah, I actually had an unrelated question, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, and this obviously doesn't need an answer now. I don't know if you've heard about this, but just um, recently at the A train, the 184th Street uh, mm -hmm. egress, the elevator, um, there are three elevators there. And I've seen just in the past week, um, like dozens of people, like three elevators worth of people waiting uh, on the on the subway side, um, and just elevators not showing up for several minutes, and I don't know why that's happening, um, but it, it's it happened once. I didn't really think about it, but then it happened again recently, and I was like, this is really strange that elevators just aren't coming. Right, like where are they? Where are and there's three, like you know, if one doesn't come, that's fine. But like all three were on the Fort Washington side, and yeah. All right, let me see if I can find out anything because, like, obviously you're you can't, you know, you got the escalator project on one side of the station, and now we have like we really need the elevators. We to really not need be a the elevators. <laughs> like we can't. Yeah. There can't be any fails. Um, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Great conversation, Deb. Lots, of, lots to work on. Indeed, uh, indeed. Thanks, guys. Sorry, I'm going to leave you a little early. Yeah, yeah. Get well, uh, Mary. Mary, quite contrary. Never. <laughs> um. Good evening, everybody. And I hope all the people that aren't feeling well get better quickly. This is not the time of the year to get sick. Um. Our last meeting, I didn't have a formal presentation, but we talked a lot about a variety of different things. Um, one thing is that, that the committee actually has been discussing for a couple of months <clears throat> is pleading to continue Zoom meetings because of the time of day that we have our meetings. It's really impossible, if not, you know, it's, it's, it's next to impossible for people to get to the meeting. And, you know, our particular committee, the aging committee has tripled its attendance since Zoom, the Zoom meetings started. And, uh, you know, we have people come from all different kinds of agencies. The directors of the senior centers are content, are continuously involved in the meetings and people from other other venues um, that would not be able to get to the meetings. In fact, we have people on the committee who would find it, you know, we're finding it before very difficult to get to the meeting <clears throat> in person. And, uh, you know, so I want to try to see if we can't please. So we actually drafted a letter which um, Eliezer is signed and it's being sent off to the borough president um, pleading our case so that we continue, so we can continue to have more members of the community that are working with the aging at our meetings. Um, this is what we strive for. We can't now as we were before COVID 
go to the senior centers because they're not open to having outside um, community uh, involvement yet. Uh, they're still, you know, having restrictions following COVID and all of that. So we can't go around from senior center to senior center, even though we'd like to get more seniors actually involved themselves. But we'll see if this letter does anything. I know we're not terribly hopeful, but um, the committee felt strongly that we should at least try. So that's being sent out. Um, we also had a fairly lengthy discussion about buses, bus routes, and part of that's being, you know, is, has been affected by the uh, the Bronx um, redistribution of, of the bus stops because um, the BX7 and the M100. Well, I understand the I understand the depot is in the Bronx, so that um, bus has been affected also. The buses are going four stops rather than two, you know, four blocks rather than two blocks, which is making it more difficult for the seniors and the frail elderly and disabled to get to the bus. And, uh, you know, the other, the other issue that came up is the M3, which travels up um, <clears throat> St. Nicholas Avenue. And the stop at 192 and St. Nicholas Avenue has been eliminated for some reason. We don't know why. The MTA, I, we brought these things to the Traffic and Transportation Committee as well. And um, the, the new fellow in charge of the MTA um, said he was gonna get back to me about that, that bus stop because what's happening up there is the seniors that live in those North buildings on Fort George Hill and on Fairview Avenue. It's already a big hill there. And now they have to walk not only from one, you know, getting off at 192, at least it's fairly close to, you know, where those hills are and their buildings are, but you have to try, have to walk from 190th up St. Nicholas as, you know, extra mileage for them. And, you know, most of those, everybody up there lives in those North buildings are elderly. They're frail elderly. They have walkers, wheelchairs, canes, you name it. And, uh, you know, have enough trouble walking as it is, but having them walk extra is, is really a hazard for them. Um, those were mainly the things. The senior center directors brought up the fact that DIFTA has been um, asking them to comply with certain things, but not giving them specific instructions as to how to do it. So they're feeling kind of lost in a way. They're wanting uh, you know, more specific uh, instruction and guidance from DIFTA. So um, we've got a couple of ways that we're gonna pursue that. And just one additional thing on Thursday, this Thursday, um, from 9.30 to 11 is our WICOA general meeting. And we're gonna be having Eric Hausman from HICAP. He's the outreach volunteer manager of, of the New York City Department for the Aging. And he's gonna be presenting on Medicare changes. So if anyone wants to join that meeting, I could send the link out if you wanna let me know, or I could ask Ebenezer to, uh, e-blasted, I guess that, that might be one, the better thing to do. Um, so, you know, anyone that would like to join that discussion is welcome. So I'll send that information to uh, Ebenezer, because I'm also the co-chair of WICOA, in case, for those that don't know. Um, that's all I have. I see a couple of hands, so I guess I got questions. Really? That's not all you have. You have Wayne and Steve. Hi, uh, Mary, you mentioned um, the desire to continue to meet virtually. My understanding is the community board or in general, our ability to meet virtually is a function of state law. So you mentioned there was a letter drafted going to the borough president. And my question is, would it be 
more advantageous to also have a letter that goes to our state elected officials to advocate for that? We could forward it, I think. Gallery's there, yes. Yeah. Or, or, or include the borough president and our state elected officials. Right, it was intended for, the original letter was intended for Senator Jackson's office and, uh -huh. and borough president's office, originally. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Wayne. All right. As usual. Point. Steve. Angel. Well, I said it, it really should uh, go to the governor. Uh, it's the governor who issues these executive orders um, and has that power. Uh, the state senator uh, doesn't, nor the assembly member, uh, nor the borough president. But uh, is this a letter that you'll be sending, uh, Ellie? Or uh, I don't know that it really should come from the committee. Uh, it really should be uh, um, a position of the board itself. Um, so I, I think if, if a letter goes out, it probably should go from you. Right. I think what. Uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Mary. Go ahead. I'm, I'm saying Eliezer did sign the letter. So, yes. Going out from him as a request from the committee. Yeah. All right. Well, okay. Angel? Um, I had a clarifying question. Uh, Mary, Wycoa is spelled how? This is for the minutes. I'm sorry? That is the spell? acronym. That's right. the acronym. It's, so is it's it... Washington Heights Inwood Council on Aging. Mm. Thank you. It's Wycoa. Yep. Sounds good. Even in Spanish, sounds good. <laughs> right. You had a lot of a lot of friends today, Mary. Um, Steve, I think you're up next. Uh, yeah, uh, so the uh, the latest uh, COVID statistics uh, show. Steve, uh, be before you start, yeah. uh, the, the shirt you were wearing on Sunday, um, you you have any plans for it besides putting it in your closet? Like, I'm 16. Uh, well, I, uh, I uh, you're, you're only a 16. Oh, well, what, yeah. what, what's your sleeve length? 42. Oh, forget yeah. it. Yeah, come on. Could you imagine what that shirt would look like on you? Um, I'll, I'll cut it. Yeah, you'll cut it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Make it into one of those uh, uh, muscle sure shirts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure yeah. Sure yeah. Yeah. yeah, that yeah, that might work. Uh, I'll, I'll consider that uh, maybe next year. Um, By the way, guys, Steve wore the dopest shirt you ever seen wear on Sunday. I mean, that shirt was off the hook. That's it. All right, later. Well, I uh, did that Include it's included in the minutes. Yeah, well, I hope so. <laughs> I, I, I hope not. And uh, okay. Um, actually, uh, is Sally still with us? No. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Listen. She is still on the call. Did Did you speak before about the event we had for her on Sunday? I briefly. Uh... Okay. But didn't go into any details, so uh, leave that up to you. No, it's, you know, it's, you know, just that uh, many of us uh, felt obligated, including the Parks Department, to uh, honor her uh, while we uh, uh, while we uh, had a chance to do so. So uh, uh, I, I thank you for coming on Sunday, and uh, we had a, a pretty good turnout of community board members who were there to uh, uh, help us uh, honor uh, Sally and all of the uh, good work that she has done. Uh, on uh, parks and environmental issues uh, over the years. And among other things, uh, uh, the Parks Department uh, announced that it was uh, um, uh, dedicating an award for stewardship, an annual award uh, would be given to uh, uh, parks volunteers uh, and it would be named the uh, Sally Fisher Stewardship Award uh, for people for, uh, specifically doing work in uh, natural areas such as uh, the Inwood Hill Park uh, Forest. Um, and um, um, I just want I, many of us, I think, uh, um, uh, were taken by uh, the emotions of that event and were uh, uh, glad that so many people showed up and, uh, uh, and paid homage to uh, Sally. Um, uh, so on the latest statistics uh, on the COVID-19, 
uh, uh, last week uh, showed a three of our four zip codes had positivity rates uh, higher than the citywide average. Uh, zip codes 32, uh, 34, and 40 uh, were all uh, over 11%, uh, uh, which was the citywide average. Uh, zip code 33 was uh, just under 9%. Uh, during that week, a total of 231 people uh, uh, were recorded as having uh, COVID. And keep in mind, this is these are only the people who have taken tests in um, uh, in uh, places where, where, that are obligated to report to the health department. So this does not include people who have tested themselves at home. Um, uh, we, we don't have any uh, such records. Uh, but what it now adds up to is that since the beginning of the pandemic, almost 61,000 people in our community have had COVID, which when you think about it is really amazing. That's like uh, about one in every three residents uh, have had COVID. Uh, uh, during this pandemic, and uh, 965 people have died in, in uh, Washington Heights and Inwood. Uh, uh, at our uh, committee meeting on November the 3rd, uh, Julio Batista from New York Presbyterian reported that they've seen an uptick in uh, COVID cases, uh, 117 cases at the uh, three sites in Washington Heights, Inwood, the Milstein, the Children's Hospital, and the Allen Hospital. And he points out, by the way, that uh, not all of these uh, uh, COVID cases that were uh, people who came into the hospital uh, knowing that they had COVID. Many of them, uh, in many, with many of them, it was detected uh, they came to the hospital for other reasons. And once they were there, uh, the hospital uh, uh, found that in fact uh, they had COVID. Because you know, after all, uh, it could also be uh, asymptomatic. Uh, so uh, Julio point uh, uh, reported that uh, the hospital is still giving out vaccines to people at the children's hospital as you know uh, you know our community is uh, uh, is below the citywide in Manhattan uh, uh, percentages for people who are getting vaccinated and so it's important that we direct people uh, to the hospital to the extent that we can uh, we discussed with him uh, having the community board uh, do more publicity send out more notices to people letting them know that they can take advantage of the vaccines uh, at uh, at the uh, Children's Hospital. Uh, he was supposed to send uh, some material to the office with the QR code. Uh, I don't know if he's done that. I don't, I don't remember seeing anything sent out by the office. Uh, so uh, I will uh, talk to him tomorrow to, uh, uh, to check on that. But I would hope that as soon as it gets sent to the office, we would send it out and, and make that maybe a, uh, a regular, uh, uh, you know, that we would keep recycling it and sending out these notices to remind people uh, that they should be getting uh, vaccinated. Uh, at, also at my committee meeting, um, uh, uh, our guest speaker was uh, Council Member uh, Carmen De La Rosa, who spoke about the uh, uh, the City Council's uh, New York City uh, uh, Clean Initiative, um, and uh, a cleanup initiative in which uh, she allocated uh, uh, two hundred eighty thousand uh, dollars. Almost two hundred thousand went to uh, seven different groups, and including the uh, bid. And uh, 83,000 went to the sanitation department uh, to provide additional litter, litter basket collections. Uh, hopefully, uh, I'll have the uh, complete breakdown in uh, the minutes of uh, my meeting. Uh, at our next meeting in December, I'm hoping to have a presentation uh, concerning the uh, uh, latest Brownfield site that we've been apprised of at uh, 401 West 207th Street uh, at, um, uh, at uh, I guess, uh, 9th Avenue next to the uh, uh, subway yards. This is uh, basically uh, the third uh, brownfield site at that particular intersection. There's a very large one on the south side, and now there are two on the north side of the street uh, between, um, uh, what is it, uh, 10th Avenue and, uh, and the University Heights Bridge. Uh, that's my report. Wayne? Uh, just a quick question for you, Steve. You may recall at the last, um, last month's meeting, there was a discussion about the a person who was shot, um, I guess, sitting in the car outside of Wendy's and why they were taken to, um, you know, I think Harlem Hospital as opposed to Presbyterian. And the, um, the discussion revolved around whether Presbyterian was a level one trauma center, which the uptown facility is not. The Presbyterian downtown is level one. 
an uptown only the children hospital is and i think you're going to try to get some more information from them on you know why you know that is uh yes yeah, th thank you wayne yeah th this is a uh, uh this is an issue that has bugged us for, for a number of years where, where we have people um um who get shot uh, who uh uh, are involved in the serious car accidents and other uh, 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 awful uh, you know, situations and uh, end up being uh, taken uh, to uh, Harlem Hospital or St. Barnabas or somewhere else other than to uh, New York Presbyterian. So uh, uh, we did raise this question at my meeting and um, uh, I, I have to say that um, uh, we're still searching for answers as to why uh, the hospital uh, ne has never applied for this designation or why it's a uh, it's a problem for them uh and uh, we're gonna still pursue this and um um uh, we we uh this this may be another letter that we would want ellie to sign uh, that would go to the state health department asking the state health department to weigh in and tell us uh um whether or not they have any issue with uh, uh with the hospital being so designated uh you know the you know what one story we get is that um is that the state only wants a limited number of such trauma centers in northern manhattan and they already have Harlem hospital so they wouldn't also want new york presbyterian i don't know if that's really uh uh based on fact and i would like to get to the bottom of it i don't think harlem hospital is a level one trauma oh, center no oh it is it, it, well let, let me let me finish um because i was looking at this and there isn't much difference between a level one and a level two trauma center medically. A level one trauma center is required to do research and uh, publishing, whereas a level two is not. But they each have to have certain surgeons who are always, you know, on site. Right. Level three, the surgeon has to be on call, but they don't have to be on site. And when I was looking at the list of trauma centers, I saw a Harlem Hospital listed, but I don't think it was level one. Well, that my impression has been that it was level one, and I did, uh, I, I, uh, I, I did have a conversation recently with, uh, uh, I believe, the head of the emergency room at Harlem, and uh, and then I believe we were talking about it as though it was a level yeah. one. But I, I would, I would check, I would check yeah. for it. But I would say, getting back to your point, given the the relative difference in resources between Presbyterian and Harlem Hospital, it's kind of hard to understand how Harlem can be even a level two or three and right. Presbyterian can't. Well, I, I I don't want to phrase it that way, but I would say that it's very hard to imagine that New York Presbyterian does not have the uh, capability of uh, serving as a level one and uh, that it doesn't have the expertise, doesn't have the, uh, uh, doesn't have the medical staff, doesn't have the space in this, uh, in its recently modernized emergency room, uh, for various reasons, I find it hard to believe that they can't serve as a level one trauma center. We, uh, as, as an additional piece of information, I uh, was able to reach out to the Manhattan Borough Director of Community Affairs Unit. Uh, her name is Tiffany Brown, who uh, also dove in into the incident and she was able to collect some of the pieces of information, one of them being was that apparently, not apparently, uh, it seems as though the, while the, the incident was happening, uh, the person that was next to the, the person that was shot, this pregnant woman, uh, just flagged an ambulance and it was a private ambulance. They didn't really call 911. So what this private ambulance did was to shoot her down to Harlem. Uh, yeah, but I, my, my understanding is that the normal process is that they check to see which emergency room uh, can can handle the case, and uh, and, and I I, it I don't think it would be appropriate. It wouldn't be the appropriate uh, uh, mo for them to just decide to go someplace without knowing that the emergency room is ready to to handle the case. And that was my following question: What is the procedure when a person gets either picked up by like an ambulance or when you call nine one one? Is there something? My, my understanding is that you call in to find out which emergency room is ready to accept the uh, uh, the patient. That, so uh, you're saying that, that that's the procedure. That's the MO. That, that, that's my understanding. And uh, um, maybe, maybe we should get clarification. Because I think I believe that one. Re I have to do some further checking, uh, but okay. I believe that uh, 
uh, when that awful uh, uh, car accident took place some months ago at uh, Sherman Avenue and uh, I think 204th Street, and uh, uh, two uh, two men were uh, run over and killed. Uh, well, I believe one of them was taken all the way over to St. Barnabas. And the only thing I can imagine is that the reason they went all the way to St. Barnabas is because maybe Harlem Hospital was already too busy to accept uh, the, the case. So they had to take the uh, take the person all the way over to say to the middle of the Bronx. Yeah, just based on my own experience before I was, uh, my surgery took place and I was having those uh, arrhythmia incidents and I used to call 911. Uh, I, 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 just, I, would also, I would always be asked, you know, to which hospital I, I wanted to go to inside the ambulance. You, you were given the choice? Yeah, I was given the choice just about every time. Really, that's that's a little strange. Yeah, when I when I when I used to live in Harlem, uh, they used to take me to St. Louis in one sixteen, yeah. or ten, yeah, and in Riverdale yeah. they used to take me to um, uh, Mountie because uh, it's closer. Yeah, never to the St. John since Riverdale because I know that I would come out of there alive. But anyways, uh, all right. Well, this this needs to be pursued further. Thank yes. you, Wayne. Yeah. Thank you. All right, uh, Steve. Uh, next, uh, our what is it, housing committee, uh, Emily Marte. Hi, everyone. Happy Tuesday. It's Tuesday already. Yes. Happy oh, Tuesday. <laughs> yeah, I could say when today and I'll believe it too. Mm -hmm. um, so I will be presenting on our last meeting and then Marielle will sp speak about our next meeting and the advances that have been made. So um, in our last meeting, uh, okay, here are my notes. In our last meeting, we had the Inwood project at 207. Um, they came to present about uh, to get a variance for extended hours. And uh, being that it was uh, probably a few hours before the meeting, um, we only allowed them to present, but no discussion because there was no time for public or for members of uh, the HHS committee to hear about it. So, um, it, it's going to be added to the agenda for our next meeting, but we allowed them to present. And if anyone wants to listen in on the um, on our last meeting so that you know a little bit about the project, then you could just listen to the YouTube recording. Uh, but they basically spoke about how the, you know, they spoke about the actual project, the Inwood project and the percentages of like, uh, which apartments are going to be in a certain area, median income, uh, and how there's going to be like a theater, a neighborhood retail, a supermarket, and accessory parking. Um, so there's more details on that. And then they were just like, well, no, we can't. We were itching to ask questions, but we just wanted to wait um, till the next meeting since it was added a few hours before the meeting. And then uh, being that I didn't know, like it, it just came up during the meeting where we were like, oh, I think we should move it to the next meeting. I had moved the 37 Hillside Avenue. Uh, well, it wasn't going to be a presentation. We actually tabled uh, the decision to extend the hours uh, because that we hadn't had enough research. So we don't like I said in our last executive meeting, that we didn't have knowledge on permits for Department of Building uh, or the weekly renewals. And if there can be a trial uh, of sorts where after a few weeks, if tenants are not happy, we could just, just halt everything if it's too much. Uh, we didn't know if we could like just be like, yes, and then no. So. Uh, we wanted to look into that more. People would e were even suggesting like talking to Wayne, which he already commented in the last executive meeting. Um, and uh, um, yeah, so it was tabled, but we did make advances on that. So I think I'll just uh, make, uh, Marielle's gonna talk about it because uh, we're gonna talk about it in the next meeting. The motion was to table the matter so that we get information from Department of Buildings and from 
uh, the community board. So we found some information and Mariel's gonna mention that. And uh, in our last meeting, uh, and this was based off of the executive meeting that we had last time, uh, and the response that was given when I gave the uh, 37 Hillside report, where um, there's a very huge lack of human services. And uh, I don't know, people seemed really upset. So I really wanted to just bring up the topic of like housing and human services committee priorities and um, to see if there were like anything, any interests or things that they thought should be tackled, yeah. uh, being that there are so many things that, that we could tackle. Uh, besides the few things that we have like been cycling the past few months. So um, people didn't really comment much. I was kind of like help, you know, forcing people to talk. Maybe it was too late. I don't know. The meeting was pretty short, so I don't know. But um, maybe I could get some more input from y'all. And uh, I know that Debbie is the one that she commented like most on it. So she's not here now, but uh Things about media, media outlets in regards to housing was mentioned, using technology, maybe for education, informing um, advocacy in regards to housing and human services, uh, the pandemic evictions, what other human services are missing. So these are just things that came up. Um, also like having contacts for the Department of Buildings uh, from uh, the community board getting city officials and agencies to come to these meetings more often uh, so that the public could see, you know, hear more about what's happening in regards to housing. Uh, and um, a few other things were mentioned such as like lead level allowance being changed and if there's gonna be new inspections and how we're gonna go about that and enforcing things and also compliance with fire code, uh, which kind of, it, it did sound like if it was an intersection of committees as well. So yeah, and then also alternative enforcement program, the AEP about distressed buildings. It's something that keeps coming up in the meetings as well. So I think that we need to pursue that and like get an actual contact and Marielle's gonna speak about that. Um, and then I, the topic, sorry, is my time up? Uh, I'm just, yeah, because you're having two presentations on the same committee, so I wanted to be right, fair. Right, right. And then the Fort Washington Armory was brought up. And um, yeah, so Marielle, she'll talk about that. And then people didn't really get to read the sanitation letter, but the community board for, they had sanitation recommendations. And there was like a letter that they sent out to us about all of the recommendations that they sent to Department of Buildings and Sanitation in regards to like rodent proof containers, waste compacting and bailing for buildings, making waste management plans applicable to more properties. And uh, they just wanted us to be in on the effort, uh, which makes sense, it's the whole city of New York. So uh, that's a document that was sent to us and we just have to read in on it. And uh, I will pass it to Marielle so that she could talk about um, our future meeting. Thanks so much, Emily. Good evening, everyone. Um, yeah, I was unable to make the November meeting because I had a prior commitment. So, um, but I obviously did watch the recording. Um, in terms of what's happening for December, as Emily mentioned, we do have a few things on the agenda as it relates to after hours variances. After a lot of snooping, um, I've been able to find a contact in the Department of Buildings um, and the individual, the representative will come to our December meeting to answer kind of one talk about the process to request after our uh, work variances. And from what was said, they, in, in terms of uh, developers submitting a request for after hours variances, they do not need or they do not, and they do not request a letter of support from community boards for it. So, um, but apparently they've had the same question come up from other community boards as well, where other developers have been approaching community boards asking for, you know, a letter of support for, for the after hours uh, working. So, Again, um, this contact, she will join us at the meeting in December, and I encourage you all uh, to attend if you are able. 
Um, and then, you know, the committee will then uh, be able to address the Inwood project as well as 37 Hillside. In terms of uh, other things on the agenda for December, um, we will kind of continue to work on the Fort Washington Armory business, really kind of figuring out who the different parties are. Um, it's obviously very complicated and really identifying who is responsible for what, because I think that's kind of a starting point as to you know where we can take things from there. As it relates to HPD and the alternate enforcement program. So we do have a contact. I was able to make a contact with someone a few months ago and I've just been following up. And so um, if they don't respond to my email, I will call um, uh, to kind of help us uh, address some of that. And again, this is in turn for the alternate enforcement program where there are several buildings in our community that are distressed um, and dilapidated. And then lastly, one thing that I wanted to bring to everyone's attention is that um, I think you all know uh, my professional background is, you know, doing stuff at the UN and, and so on. And I continue to do so even on maternity leave. But um, <laughs> December 10th is uh, International Human Rights Day. And so what I would like to do, and this is also kind of addressing some of the concerns that I think some of you, but others and, and even myself, uh, you know, there's a lot of need in our community, um, and I think we would like to put forward a resolution. Obviously, it would need to be uh, discussed and voted on a committee, but really encouraging the community board to think about things through the human rights perspective and the human rights lens. Um, I think what's incredibly important is that, you know, we think about this. Um, there is a universal declaration of human rights, and one of the, the founding authors of that was actually a former First Lady, Eleanor Roosevelt. So there, there's a lot of kind of U.S. and American uh, tradition in this international document. And how do we take something that's international and then make it local to apply right here in Washington Heights and Inwood? So that's something we'll be working on. Um, and so uh, look forward to that. Um, that's all for me. Thank you. Okay, thank you guys for the double wham. We appreciate a lot of information coming from your committee, a lot of work. Steve, I think you have a question slash comment slash Steve's. Uh, Steve. Yes, uh, thank you. I have, a, I have a couple of comments. Uh, for, first of all, um, uh, Mario and Emily, I would urge you the, uh, that if you're considering this Inwood project on, at your next meeting, uh, that, uh, that on the agenda that goes out from the community board, you specifically put down the address of the building uh, of the project since uh, uh, th there are a lot of different projects going on in Inwood. And uh, I, I think we need to identify that this is the one uh, between, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, uh, 207. Nine, 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 so, nine, yeah, nine, 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 the old Pathmark site. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that, that would be helpful if you actually marked it, put down it's the old Pathmark site so people mm -hmm. understand what it is we're talking about. And I would, uh, I would also suggest that we post flyers in the adjoining uh, buildings on 9th Avenue and 206th Street, so the people who live right there uh, know that this is going to be up for discussion. Uh, mm -hmm. and they have a chance to uh, uh, to hear what the story is. And uh, and let me also say that if you're going to uh, uh, delve into the uh, uh, lead paint hazard issue uh, and the, and this uh, sanitation issue, uh, they uh, these sort of overlap into my committee. So uh, I would uh, I would appreciate the opportunity to work with you on it on both of those issues. For sure. Thanks so much, Steve. Certainly. All right. Thank you, guys. Um, Wayne, you're up next. Okay. So no resolutions from land use for its November meeting. Um, we had a guest speaker, which was Councilman uh, Sean Abreu. Uh, and he was invited, actually, the October meeting, but we were scheduled to discuss um, the planning and zoning priorities that the community board and the land use committee have been talking about for the last um, several years, including the, you know, the planning study that the community board undertook with City College years ago, um, contextual zoning, um, the more recent discussions of the area west of Broadway between 155th and 177th at zone R8, which basically allows as of right density um, double than anything else in the area. Um, he shared with us that he, I think he has that information. Uh, he has not made up his mind um, about, you know, what he is going to support, but he did point out that the city council is very focused on 
um, you know, producing as much affordable housing as possible. And, you know, that means adding density to the city. So a couple things that the committee raised is when we're talking about density, um, going back to the CB12 planning study, it pointed out that there were areas we were interested in preserving neighborhood character. And there were other areas where, and typically like along major avenues and intersections where, you know, we thought you could in fact add more density, but it needs to be done in a thoughtful manner. Uh, we also pointed out, going back to what, you know, Emily and Marielle were just talking about, when we talk about affordable housing, the projects that have been presented in, you know, Community District 12, as well as some of the projects that have been reported about in Community Board 11 and Community Board 10, the lower end of affordability is like 70 or $73,000. Mm -hmm. And that's probably for a studio apartment. So right. the, if the city council is focused on adding density and they're focused on affordable housing, they really need to be mindful of what the developers at HPD are doing vis-a-vis -vis affordability. Because at that rate, which is not saying at 70,000, you're at least a bit rich, but it's 50% higher than the local household average here in Community District 12. Um, so, you know, we, we talked about that and, you know, it's the beginning, not the end of a conversation, although something he shared is with the revisions to the city council maps, that area, um, the R8 area that's between 155th and 177th was primarily um, his, but now it's split between him and Carmen de la Rosa. And he said it was about one third, two thirds, but I think it's closer to a 50-50 split. Um, we did speak to Carmen about this already, so she's aware of it, but it's a, it needs to be a joint effort. The committee also had an informal discussion of the City of Yes zoning text amendment. And I say it's informal because that zoning text amendment has not yet been referred out to community boards to comment on, but we wanted to be a bit proactive uh, because as you recall last year, there were a number of zoning um, amendments that came with very tight time frames for community boards to respond. And in looking at that, although the, the stated intent to promote affordable housing and to foster economic recovery and to have a more sustainable you know, future, sound great you know we thought that more education was needed and what are the actual goals you know how are zoning regulations being changed and you know what consideration was given to what are the problems or the issues that those zoning regulations originally were put in place to cover and how does changing them you know has city planning and the mayor's office determined that those issues are no longer of concern or is it something that's just being changed in order to say you're giving less red tape for um, businesses so things can move faster? Uh, we thought, once again, more thought was needed. And at this juncture, city planning said they the text is not written. It will probably be written sometime uh, next year. They're gathering information, but we will see what comes out of that. And then during public session, community residents raised the the Cumming Street BSA, which I believe was considered once again today by the Board of Standards and Appeals. Um, and that is something where I said we need to be careful uh, because it was shared with us and Ebenezer and uh, Eli, I believe you know this, it was shared with us at the committee level that the Board of Standards and Appeals in July mm -hmm. told the applicant to outreach to the community board um, and I guess to residents to get their input before resubmitting. And of course that did not happen. Right. Um, Ebenezer in his outreach to BSA, just to let them know that we have not received anything new and therefore the resolution that was passed November of last year still holds, you know, BSA did not indicate that, you know, they told the applicant to come back to us. So uh, I think it's always important for the community board to get the information from the horse's mouth, so to speak, before it acts on what it's told, you know, sort of uh, second or third hand um, and pass resolutions or take actions based upon that, which is not to say 
we don't want to have, you know, information come back to us so that we don't want to have further outreach. But, you know, if we assume that what we were told is correct, we would have, you know, perhaps, you know, acted in a certain way, having gotten confirmation from BSA that, you know, it's not quite correct. We now need to get clarification on what, if anything, the applicant was told to do. Where are we now? What was the outcome of today's meeting? And then we can act intelligently and in an informed manner. Steve. And Steve, yeah. Um, so, uh, Wayne, at the meeting, we did discuss uh, uh, sending a, a letter and or the uh, past resolution. That was done. To, to the BSA prior to today's meeting. So it right. was done? Yeah, so I, I reached out to uh, okay. Ebenezer and Eli about that last week, and it was confirmed that um, uh, Ebenezer contacted them. I guess they forwarded the, the um, November resolution, but it's in that context of coordination that it was, you know, confirmed that, yeah, I mean, while there is, that there was a meeting uh, today, we were told it was the 14th, it's actually the 15th, but the the information that was shared with us, Steve, that in July, the okay. applicant was told to reach out to us, there was no confirmation that okay. that's accurate. Yeah, all right, yeah, all right, I'm not, I'm not especially surprised, but, uh, but, but we, the important thing is that we did uh, reiterate our position and say- Yeah, we said, you know, basically, we, we have, you know, we did not receive any updated information. We understand that um, it was being, it was resubmitted, which we knew that happened on the 25th, that it's being considered today. Um, absent any new information, absent any updated plans, our position is as reflected in the resolution passed in November of last year. All right. It and remains did, unchanged. Okay. And did, did you take a look at that resolution? Is it, uh, did it, did it read okay? I sent that resolution, Stephen, uh, to the entire committee to read. So, but the point is, the resolution is the resolution. That's what everyone put together. And, you know, after, you know, all of the friendly edits, and that's what was sent to BSA November of last year. So that's our position. All righty. Thank you. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you, Steve. Uh, Cedro. Thank you. Uh, so the license committee met on Wednesday. We had about 13 uh, resolutions. Some of them were withdrawn at the meeting or prior to. We had no contentious uh, applicant, with exception of maybe one applicant that uh, had contradictory remarks uh, between uh, the prison and themselves. So we took uh, our time to make sure that we understand uh, where the problem was emanating from. And finally, after we uh, delivered and heard our both side, we uh, voted on, the, on this applicant. And um, that was basically it. No major issues uh, coming up from licensing. About four or five of them were withdrawn. And in total, there were like 13. Uh, there was uh, one that requested um, corporate change. There were uh, new legal licenses and on-premise, uh, sorry, uh, restaurant wine licenses, and then the rest were like probably uh, renewal. So that's it on my end, uh, nothing major to report. If there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Beautiful, I like that. No noise, right? No. <laughs> um, uh, just to get a uh, report on uh, Daryl on the, on the tax force. Uh, yeah. Hi, <clears throat> thank, thank you, Ellie. Yeah. Um, uh, we are looking to have our first meeting uh, very shortly, either later this month or early next month. Um, at that point, will the committee will kind of lay out a timeline um, and kind of a, a process of how we're going to go, you know, section by section through the bylaws and and see what updates uh, can be made that makes sense uh given current environment changes to the to the city charter etc um so and then we'll certainly be looking uh for input uh from everybody else so we look forward to that i did have another thing unrelated to that is now a good time or is there a new business section new business section okay all right thank you 
Okay, good. Uh, on new business, so we can move along. Uh, uh, beginning on December 1st, no, December 5th, uh, our office will uh, have the presence of two new uh, YESPs, I think is what you call them, is a program that you hire uh, students part time. Uh, I want to call them interns, but because uh, they get paid by the city of New York. So they each will spend 12 hours a week, total of 24 hours. Uh, uh, Solang Hill, Betances, I think is one of the names, and Pedro something. They all go to the uh, the academy in 160th between Amsterdam and Broadway. I think it's PS4, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, they are scheduled to spend a lot of time in our social media and outreach piece that we have liked so much. Uh, we're gonna try and put one of them and assign one of them to try and work on our Facebook page and our uh, create an Instagram page and our YouTube page, uh, especially uh, when we update our calendars and all the information that we provide and the letters that are distributed to the members should also be part of the social media piece. So we're gonna try and schedule and assign those two new interns that will be with us for a couple of months to try and get us up to date and bring us into uh, more of a technology friendly uh, community board. Uh, that's what I have on. Uh, how, how old are they? Uh, 18, really? senior. Okay. Yeah, they, they've, they were with us last month uh, during the summer. So maybe, maybe they're from the Community Health Academy of the Heights? Yeah, they are, yeah. Oh, oh okay, on, a, on 150, uh, 150, 6, 150th, 59th, or 160th? 158th, I think. 158th, yeah, that's where they come from. Yeah, so okay. All right. Um, um, yes, uh, I, I may have missed it earlier. Did, did, you, did you say whether we're going to have a nominating committee report at the next uh, board meeting? Ah, uh, that's correct. Okay. That is correct. And new business, uh, Daryl. You want me to speak to that or? Yes, I do. Okay, great. Yeah, I uh, spoke with um, Ebenezer earlier today. And um, so the information about who's eligible uh, will be uh, coming out to me in the committee soon. And then once that happens and probably... Um, you know, before Thanksgiving, we'll be making calls to to folks um, who are eligible to see their interest in the uh, in the next year. So we're very exciting. The, the committee has been appointed. Yes. Mm -hmm. I hear Angel shaking his head like we're supposed to hear when he when he shakes his head. <laughs> Speak up. It was announced at the last general meeting, Steve. Yes, it was. Very open. Oh, all right. I, I'm sorry. I, I wasn't there. <laughs> okay. So, new business. Anyone else before I put a motion? I, to, I did, yeah, yeah, I did have one other thing. Um, and that was just about, and I, I'm not sure, maybe guidance would be helpful from you all. Um, there are folks, uh, my, myself, trying to look at a possible resolution regarding Yeshiva University um, and its continued um, opposition to an LGBT student run club. Um, so I'm not sure what committee that would fall under though. Human rights. I mean, uh, housing and- uh... yeah. I mean, it may, I was thinking it was a human right HHS, but it's um, we wouldn't necessarily be asking that agency to do anything. Um, and then for full disclosure, I work for that agency. So I don't, it, uh, pro probably goes to youth and education. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah that's I think, exactly it, I I think it's it, it, that's higher education. So I would just put it on so there. Kathy and Steve are right. Yeah, it should really go to education. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I didn't that hear that part. I didn't uh, hear what you said. We go like you as uh, Catherine and Steve are right. You should go through youth and education. They so cover I don't think education's 
limited like our education committee is not limited only to the uh to k through 12. no okay right. yeah 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 for volunteers because it's always attached to the youth so we think of it as just you know you know high school but yeah it, it does extend beyond that but it'll be interesting to see um how that plays out uh two more comments or questions are uh, mary and then marielle I just have a question about um, our our letter going out to um, Mark Levine. Should we send it to the governor? Um, the other state elections? Yes, we are. Simply, okay. You should see them all in separate letters so that it looks more. Right. Okay. Personal. Thank you. Good enough, Mariel. Yes, um, to Daryl's point, I would say yes, youth and education, but it, it would be helpful to get input from Housing and Human Services. Again, um, kind of pushing the line that, you know, we want to do a little bit more on the human services side as well. So that would be a great opportunity for us to support it on that. And then a separate point is um, about two or three weeks ago, I, I can't remember, I sent out an email to the entire board. Um, about DYCD's community needs assessment survey. Uh, it takes less than 10 minutes. Please share with your networks. It's anonymous. The deadline is the end of December, uh, but really uh, it's incredibly helpful to help uh, DYCD identify what types of programs and things that we need here in our community, whether it be more food pantries and food banks, more after school programs, career readiness, literacy, so on and so forth. All the things that we complain about that we feel we don't have enough of, here's an opportunity for you to provide input. So please do. Thank you. So thank you. I think we made it through. I think that uh, it was interesting to see uh, so many different opinions and conversations and uh, uh, Sally, uh, seeing Sally again was uh, really, really helpful. Uh, so uh, without more more to say, I would like to put a motion on the floor to get the meeting adjourned. Our second. I, I, uh, Ellie, I'm sorry, one more question. The, the, the general meeting, will, will it be in person or remote? We're gonna pray to God that uh, the new elected governor doesn't extend that mandate and we can go in and enjoy the United Palace the theater. They renovated the United Palace. Renovated? God. Um, yeah, it's all, right. Cool. all right. So we're, so we're waiting to hear whether the governor extends the executive order? Uh, yes, we are. I think when is it expires on the 20th, right? Any something, something like that. Yes. Yeah. Okay, guys. Great night. Take care. Good night.